this week's uh, evening of Paris of Love. Juliana, as I mentioned before, is a uh, poet, uh, memoirist, uh, a prolific writer, a very sensitive and engaging interviewer with a YouTube channel in interview, inter interviewing international voices and international personalities. She's also on radio broadcasting and uh, tonight though she'll be reading from her vignettes uh, about, uh, I was talking with her earlier, more vignettes about her time here in Paris where she spent uh, 25 years uh, here. So please, without further ado, give a big round of applause to Giuliana. There we go. I've come here especially from England, from Brighton, to be here tonight. And I'm really, really pleased to be back in Paris. And I'm seriously wanting to almost move back here. Uh, now, I used to be in the antique trade. And, uh, of course, we were all very marginal. And I met a lot of eccentric characters, both the dealers and also the collectors. So the first vignette today tonight, I should say, is Mad Collectors number six. If you want to know any of the other stories, the other vignettes, you have to go to my website, which is giliana.com. That's J-I-L-L-I-A-N-A.com. So here we go. Uh, I have to say, my, I was married to a magician, a conjurer, and so I always refer to him as Magical Martin. So this is Mad Collectors number six. Magical Martin and I spent a couple of weeks in communist Budapest in the early 80s. So naturally, I had to go to the weekend flea market. There was nothing much to buy for my international clients in London, Paris, and New York until I saw a watch dealer selling an old looking erotic timepiece in the form of a fob watch. It was tick-tocketing away, and if you lifted the underside lid, a copulating couple were at it, tick-tocking away. But was it an original or a repro? I had no way of knowing, as I was not a timepiece expert, and I certainly had had years of experience dealing in erotica, sepia 1920s postcards photographs, prints, and stereo cards in Paris. Having bought nothing else in Budapest, I decided to risk it and purchased my first timepiece. Back I went to Paris with my trophy. I had to be careful who, I, who saw it, and I finally showed it to my toy dealer colleague, Denny Ozan, who also owned an art bookshop in the 6th. Today it's in the 9th. He said I had to meet the number one erotica collection in Paris and would arrange a discreet personal introduction. Thus, I entered the world of affluent Alan Karnschrieber. Not knowing what or who to expect, I was invited to his office. There, I encountered a handsome, virile, dynamic Jewish something in the city businessman connected with finance. But despite his office being contemporary and small, it housed, proudly standing in the corner, a gigantic phallus made of glass. The man had a sense of humor, for sure. I didn't comment, of course, but glanced casually like it was the normal, everyday object to see. After all, who else would dare to have such a piece of art in his private office? Time to look at my timely treasure. Alan examined it carefully with a loop, but thought it wasn't original. However, he made a phone call to a friend, only to be told to ring back at 10 to the hour. Why, I inquired. Alan laughed and said he was a psychiatrist and his patient would go at 10 to. An appointment only lasted 50 minutes. No, that collector didn't want my fault because he already had one and it was a fake. However, it had given me an introduction to an important collector who had bought a lot of Michel Simon's famous erotica collection at the five auctions at Hotel Drouot. 
I was thus invited to see his collection one evening. Alain's claim to fame was that he had married Marie Laforet in 1971, the famous singer and actress, and fathered their child. It seemed his ex-wife had had many husbands, and today at 79 lives in Switzerland. I reckon Alain must be the same age if he is still alive, but I can only find two references for him on Google. He lived in a prestigious building, which I think he owned with his wife, or was she his mistress, who had just produced another baby. Madame was not pleased to meet me when I arrived at the flat. There she was, writing out cookery recipes in the kitchen, totally disinterested in my presence. Alain whisked me away upstairs to an interesting, intimate, very traditional French burgundy bookish apartment on the top floor where his collection was housed. He showed me ethnic objects, porcelain figures, books, prints and paintings by famous artists. The top end of the market and definitely not pornographic. The man was a historian and knew his subject. Uh, he was also a fine art collector and loved beautiful women on and off the canvas. As he knew I was a specialist in pre-cinema, the only thing that stands out in my mind all those decades ago was a neurotic zoetrope band that he spun for me on his zoetrope. Phallus's glow viewed through the slats, popping up and down, as the black drum spun round, a sight to behold. After an educational couple of hours, we ventured down to Madame, who was meant to feed me. I don't recall that they ate, but I was offered a mere salad, some bread, and then a final goodbye ice cream. The atmosphere in the kitchen was stilted, and I was starving. Did she suspect that we'd been at it in the library? No, surprisingly, after that, our paths would cross at La Villette, Chateau, and La Bastille, the Paris Brocanc Fair, always hand in hand with a beautiful Swiss fashion designer, blonde woman called Claudia. Their language was English, and I distinctly heard her call, call him, oh, heard him call her an old cow one afternoon. Obviously, they were a handsome, fun-loving couple, and I suppose he was estranged from the jealous madame, who no doubt was a good cook, but not the night I was invited. I don't recall ever selling anything to Alain, as he was the top end of the erotic market, but I did sell the fob to Elliot Barouche, the owner of the prestigious gallery Popoff. Russian art gallery on the Faubourg Saint Honoré, right opposite the Elysee Palace, who happened to be the lover of my then close friend, uh, American friend Carmen. However, that's for another vignette. a few days ago here in Paris because I was um, staying in a studio on Rue Richet and that was off the Faubourg Montmartre and that brought back a memory and this is what I wrote about the memory. A hot spicy afternoon in Paris. In the early 70s I was invited to Seuss by a young Tunisian colleague at the hotel, at London Hilton Hotel, called Shelley. He suggested I book a double room while he would stay with his mother in the Medina. He thought he was getting a cheap deal until he discovered, after I had booked on a cheap package holiday, that Tunisians could not travel at the same cheap rate as us Brits, and he would be fined by Air Tunis for the difference on arrival. Naturally, he cancelled, leaving me high and dry. Guilty, 
He gave me gifts to take to his mother with a letter of introduction and more gifts for his two brothers. One rich, living in Tunis, and the other a poor Dolmush driver. A mishmash of class structure with his mother, I was to discover on arrival, eating couscous on the floor. Eventually, I was invited by the generous rich brother, Ali, to stay a couple of nights at his home in Tunis. I was then driven to the hilly tourist village of Sidi Boussaid, where I fell in love with the famous bird cages that were for sale everywhere and did the girl in the 1970s. While haggling for a good price, I encountered a Jewish Tunisian couple from Paris, originally from Tunis, and back to visit their parents who had never emigrated. Madame, the no nosy, wanted to know the name of the family I was staying with. On hearing the name Shelley, she turned to André, her husband, proclaiming it was not a Jewish name. Well, why should it be? I excitedly said to the businessman that I would love to return to the enchanting city of lights, and could I look him up, as I knew no one to show me the sights of Paris. Mais oui, said he, proffering his business card, stating that he was an agent immobilier. A few years later, I came to live in Paris in 1977 through happenstance. Having kept André's precious visiting card carefully in my Paris box, put aside for a rainy day. I rang the man, even though I could hardly recall his facial features, only that he had middle-aged spread and a pot belly. Frankly, he was amazed and perhaps had no idea who I was. He told me to come to his office in the business area of Faubourg Marmat in the 9th. I had visions of him inviting me to a North African restaurant for a good couscous and then driving me round Paris. I was young and ghost back then. Little did I suspect what it, he had in mind for his just desserts. I found the office with difficulty. It was down a dark, sinuous passage. A naked lamp bulb hung over his desk housing a stack of papers in two piles. He was dressed in a dark gray suit, a pressed white starch shirt with a loud striped tie, smoking a huge Havana. Shaking my hand warmly, he snapped his fingers and a genie appeared magically. Andre ordered him to bring the car round to the front saying that he would return in a couple of hours. We got into a large, chic, shiny silver Mercedes with burgundy leather seating that smelt of style and quality. He drove a few mile, a few yards and stopped in front of a merguez sandwich stand in the busy street. Rolling down the window, he beckoned the seller over, ordering in Arabic, two enormous baguettes stuffed with sausages. That was lunch. Did I not merit more? The car purred slowly to its destination, or should I say, Andre's chosen destination, a park furnished apartment in an expensive gated block with a big double bed in the chic Ile Saint Louis. Silently, he took two plates down from the glass streamlined cupboard placing the wrapped baguettes on each, saying, mange. I had never experienced a merguez before. I took one bite into the spicy sausage and screamed for water, almost falling off my chair. Mon Dieu, I was in culture shock. He was in orgasmic heaven. I ate nothing. Andre was satisfied with his lunch. Then I saw the familiar glint in his eye as he mentally undressed me. Sex was on his mind. An afternoon fuck his wife would never know about. Of course, he presumed that was what I wanted and needed. 
I was lucky he didn't rape me, but after I told him I was a respectable Jewish girl from Liverpool and not looking for a quick fuck, he became quite paternal and asked me, did I really want to see the Paris sights? May we? And so we purred away, moi starving, but André a satisfied and bemused, cunning, successful Havana smoking man of the world who took great pride in showing me some of the key points of his adopted city, Paris. We, bien sûr, never met again, and nor have I tasted a merguez since. <laughs>